Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on calcium signalling. In this video, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the nuclear factor of activated T cells, or the NFAT. Uh, and we're also going to uh, look at uh, the nuclear factor kappa B, which are both uh, very important transcription factors in um, immunology. But they're also they were well they were originally discovered uh, in immunological circumstances, so they're very important in activating immune cells. Uh, but they are transcription factors that are seen in non-immune cells. Um, so uh, their importance in biology goes beyond the immune system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe the mechanism by which you activate both of these um, nuclear factors, these transcription factors, and then we're going to discuss how um, calcium oscillations are extremely good at um, getting uh, the most um, activation of these receptors for your, um, well, for your for your for the amount of calcium you're bringing into the cytoplasm it's far better to bring that calcium in in oscillations rather than to just bring it all in in one go basically so getting the most um the most i don't know the most stuff the most activation for the amount of calcium you're bringing in basically Okay, and we'll see how you can do that, how experiments can show that. And uh, we'll see how uh, there is a optimal frequency at which you um, have calcium oscillations for the activation of each of these. And for the nuclear factor activated in T-cells, what you need is an interval between calcium spikes of around two minutes. That's the optimum. And uh, then uh, for NF-kappa B, uh, you need a, um, a, a um, interval uh, between calcium spikes are around 30 minutes. That's how you can get uh, maximal stimulation of NF-kappa B. So firstly, what we'll do uh, then is uh, talk, about, um, talk about the mechanism by which each of these is activated. Okay, so we'll start off with the nuclear factor activated in T cells. Okay, so when the nuclear factor active, of activated T cells is inactive, then it is in the cytoplasm of the cell. So this is the nuclear factor of activated T cells at the moment, or NFAT uh, for short, activated T cells. Right, okay, so NFAT for short is equal to NFAT. Basically, when it's inactivated, it is in, uh, well, when it's inactive, it's in the cytoplasm of cells. So if we draw uh, a cell here, it's not at the moment in the nucleus. It's here, basically. And uh, when it's in the inactive state, it has a region known as the SRR, which stands for serine-rich region. And basically, these serine residues are all um, phosphorylated when this um, nuclear factor of activated T cells is inactive. So this is the serine-rich region. Now, let me just remind you of the structure of a serine residue. So um, if we look at the um, amino acid serine, let's draw out the structure of our amino acid serine. So here's the amino uh, group of our amino acid. Here's the alpha carbon, which you have in all amino acids, with a hydrogen off it. Here's the carboxyl group of your amino acid coming off your alpha carbon. And then off this uh, alpha carbon, you also have the R group. Now, in serine, what you have is a methylene group, like so, uh, with a hydroxyl group coming off that. <clears throat> okay, so this is the amino acid serine. So basically, in this serine-rich region, you have lots of these serine uh, residues making up your protein. Now, when this protein, the nuclear factor of activated T cells, is in the inactive state, these serine residues are phosphorylated, which means that instead of having a hydrogen coming off this oxygen here, instead what you have is you have a phosphate group coming off here. So let me draw you the structure of a phosphate group. So a phosphate group has a phosphorus atom at the centre with a double bond to an oxygen up there, uh, two hydroxyl groups coming off it, like so, 
and then a single bond with an oxygen which has gained an electron from somewhere uh, to uh, fill its final um, electron pair and uh, that gives it a negative charge. Okay, uh, so um, what you can do to phosphorylate the serine residue is you can um, take off you can perform basically a condensation reaction where you take off the hydroxyl group from this phosphorus atom and a hydrogen from this hydroxyl group. You bind those together to make water, so H2O comes off, and then you bind this oxygen to the phosphorus atom instead, and that uh, forms you a link between the phosphate group and the serine, and that phosphorylates the serine, basically. So, uh, in the inactive nuclear factor of activated T cells, what you have is loads of these phos uh, phosphate groups on these serine residues. So, <coughs> excuse me. So the serine-rich region is full of phosphorylated serine. So I'll just show uh, these circles sticking off the edge, and these will denote the phosphate groups that are uh, sticking off these serine residues of the serine-rich region. So. These denote this phosphate group, if you like, here. Okay, so they are denoting this here. Right. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in the uh, in a cell where the nuclear factor of activated T cells is inactive, it, it's sitting in the cytoplasm. And to denote that it's sitting in the cytoplasm, people will often write N fat, and then they'll put a little C uh, subscripted to denote that it's in the cytoplasm. So cytoplasmic nuclear factor of activated T cells. Okay, now when it is in the cytoplasm, in its inactive state, what's keeping it in the cytoplasm is all these phosphate groups bound to uh, the serine rich region. Now, there is an enzyme which is capable of removing those phosphate groups, and uh, that enzyme is known as calcineurin. So we'll draw this enzyme over here. Okay, so this is the enzyme calcineurin. Okay, and calcineurin, which is often just denoted CN for short, is activated when calcium calmodulin complexes come and bind to it. So, uh, when um, let's just go over firstly the structure of calmodulin. So, calmodulin is a protein which has two lobes and a linear polypeptide uh, linking uh, those two lobes. So, here we have the N lobe and here we have the C lobe, okay? And um, between these two lobes, you have this polypeptide linker, which links the N lobe to the C lobe. Now, the two lobes of calmodulin both have calcium binding sites uh, present in their structures, basically. And these calcium binding sites are specifically uh, EF hand domains. And because uh, you've got two of them, they're actually in an EF hand dimer, okay? So I'll just briefly talk about what an EF hand domain is. So there are many different uh, protein structures which are capable of uh, detecting a change in calcium in, uh, the, uh, in their surroundings, basically. And one of those protein structures is known as an EF hand domain. And EF hand domains, their general structure is, looks something like this. You have a sort of loop formed from the polypeptide like so. And the amino acids in this loop, basically, so if I draw these little intervals to denote each amino acid in this polypeptide, so one of these little intervals is uh, the site of an amino acid, then the amino acids that make up this loop are uh, generally acidic residues, which means that they have um, R groups which are acidic, so they're acidic amino acid residues. Now, if their R groups are acidic, that means that they uh, will like to donate protons away. So, uh, these R groups will donate their protons away, and when they donate that positive charge away, they themselves go uh, gain a negative charge, basically, because originally if the amino acid molecule is neutral, if it throws away a proton, it's going to end up negatively charged. Okay, uh, so what you end up with is a lot of negatively charged residues facing in to the centre of this loop here. And that means that calcium, which is a divalent cation, can come and bind to um, these, well, it can come and co be coordinated uh, between these negatively charged amino acid residues. And uh, that can then activate the EF hand domain. 
Right, okay, now EF handmains are rarely found uh, on their own, basically. Instead, what you often find is EF hands in dimers. So you'll have one EF hand, and then next to it you'll have another EF hand, like so. Okay, so you find often EF hand dimers uh, sitting next to each other. Okay, and this is what you have in the lobes of cow modulin. You have two EF hands dimerized together with this linker region between the two EF hand domains, which means that a calcium ion combines to this EF hand and a calcium ion combines to this EF hand, and therefore two calcium ions can overall bind to the EF hand dimer. And that's what these two um, calcium binding sites are here. They're the two binding sites that come from the two EF hand uh, dimers, well, the, the two EF hand domains in an EF hand dimer. Right. Okay, uh, so uh, this molecule that I've drawn here is the state of calmodulin when it doesn't have calcium bound to it, basically. So, uh, the uh, calmodulin molecule without calcium bound to it is called apocalmodulin, okay? Or people often denote it apocam or apocam to denote calmodulin. Cam like that with a capital C, lowercase a, and then capital M. Right. Now, if calcium binds to the uh, EF hand dimers of each of the lobes of calmodulin, now since you have four calcium binding sites, you'll need four calcium ions to bind, uh, then what it does is it changes the conformation of the calmodulin protein. And what happens, basically, is that these two lobes move further apart, like so. Uh, and this linker, this polypeptide linker, which linked the two lobes, the N lobe with the C lobe, it was linear in apocalmodulin, but now what it becomes is an alpha helical shape, basically, like a spring. So it, the linker also changes conformation when uh, you go from being apocalmodulin to being what's now known as a calcium calmodulin complex. So this is calmodulin bound to four calcium ions. You've got a calcium ion bound here, a calcium ion bound here, calcium bound there, and a calcium bound there. So this is the calcium calmodulin complex. Calcium calmodulin complex. And it's sometimes uh, often denoted uh, Ca2 plus uh, CAM for CAM. Okay, right. Anyway, we'll continue this discussion in the next video.